Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the It's Worth the Shot. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the role of the Infection Control Committee and the Infection Control Risk Assessment. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay, we just have a couple of updates and reminders I wanted to share with you guys. Um, there's a lot of information coming out right now about the RSB. There's some new resources put out from the CDC. Um, just in case you guys didn't see it, the MMWR was published and it has all of the recommendations from the ACIP. Um, so that's uh, some good information for you guys as well. But I wanted to um, show you guys this little graphic here. This is always a good reminder of the different symptoms as we, I don't even want to mention it, but as we get into the flu and cold season um, and even RSV, just a really great graphic reminder. So we've put the source on here. So if you guys are in the process of updating some of your resources for your facilities, this is a good reminder as well. And that's from the National Foundation of Infectious Disease. Um, there's also some resources from Glaxo, Smith, and Klein. Um, the sideline RSV and the RSV and me, those are more community facing resources um, that you guys can take a look at. And if I can share my screen real quick, I'd like to show you guys the um, vaccine. Okay, so this is a really good tool also from GSK and it has all of the different um, vaccines. Obviously RSV is not on here yet because it's not out yet, but you guys can take a look at the vaccines. Um, so this one is influenza. You can see the administration rates, um, kind of this one targets influenza. This shows the entire country. So you can look over Wyoming, Montana, Alaska. Um, so you can kind of see the different percentage rates. So this is a kind of a neat tool for you guys to take a look at. So I'm going to go ahead and stop share. Okay, um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, just a reminder, um, go ahead and add your topics. You guys can add those into the chat or um, if you guys put them on the evaluation, which we'll post in the chat at the end, if you guys wouldn't mind taking a minute to fill that out at the end, we appreciate that. We look at your comments and we try to make sure we address your requests. Um, we will continue to meet every Wednesday, so make sure you join us. And we are going to have a quick polling question. Okay, have you started to plan for fall flu clinics? <laughs> Almost immediately, 100% no. Oh, it's looking better. Okay, kind of more in the positive 60-40 split. Okay, we'll go ahead and end the poll there. Thank you guys. I'm glad to see some of you guys are already starting to work on your flu clinics. That's great. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And again, as you plan for flu clinics, start planning for your um, RSV potentially as well if your residents are eligible for that. So um, just some updates on your COVID hospitalizations, deaths and emergency visits, um, hospitalization, the hospitalizations and deaths are still declining. Um, so that's wonderful. And then let's go ahead and go to the next one. And this one, um, as you can see, is pretty much the same as last week's report. Um, in our territories, we don't have any, um, we're low in all of those, so that's good. 
and there's a comment in the chat. Um, I see Guam is one of the last places to get updated vaccines. So um, we can reach out on that. And let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So from last week, we had a question. Um, it was regarding the culture change and treatment of COVID-19 um, residents during outbreak. What can we do to, to support resident choice while on isolation? Um, and this was some feedback that we've received. So with infections and outbreaks um, being incorporated into standard infections, we should make all efforts to continue to support resident choice um, and that means activities, food, activities of daily living, education, all of these kind of things. So an example may be to include a group activity like making smoothies. So since the resident can't participate in that group activity, um, you can do that activity with them using personal protective equipment, those kind of things. So try to do it in their room or try to accommodate so that they can still participate. All right, um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I will turn the time over to Terry. And we appreciate Terry joining us today. Thank you. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks for the invite to present today on infection prevention control committees and the infection control risk assessment. Um, hopefully you guys will have some good questions. Next slide. So I thought I would just touch base um, on a few um, objectives. We'll, we'll um, talk about the infection prevention and control program briefly. I won't go into any great detail. Um, but we'll discuss the role of the infection control committee and how that plays into your program. And then um, we'll talk about risk assessments and that will probably be the meat of the discussion today um, with some examples. Next slide. So I wanted to just start from the beginning, not making assumptions that um, everybody on this call are um, seasoned IPs. I know that some of our IPs are newer into the profession and still getting their feet wet. So from an infection prevention and, perspe and control perspective, um, having a good robust program is important. Um, the work that we do focuses on minimizing or eliminating the risk of infection. Um, it, and the cornerstone is having a resilient um, process in place to um, prevent patient harm, resident harm, whatever your um, setting is. Infection, and infection prevention and control consists of programs, guidance and standards, education and training, um, supplies and equipment, monitoring and surveillance, investment, governance, research and accountability. And I highlighted governance there because that's where your infection control committee comes into play. It's kind of from, for an infection prevention department, that infection control committee kind of governs the work that we do. Um, the committee is responsible for overview of the program and it makes recommendations to the medical staff and other hospital committees on infection control issues. So that committee becomes kind of the body that can help push out the work that we do and help explain why certain things go into play. So moving forward, next slide. I threw this in just because I think it's a nice example of um, a robust program. This is from the World Health Organization. And if you focus on that middle purple section, again, it goes back to kind of what I highlighted on the previous slide, guidelines. Um, so our Infection Prevention and Control Committee will help build and develop guidelines, um, policies and procedures, um, anything that we want to roll out. Education and training, so it will help us focus on some of the education and training, what's important and who needs to get it. Um, surveillance is a big one that we'll take back to our infection control committee. We um, put our program in place, we identified what we're gonna do, um, but we need to monitor how things are going and, and that's where our surveillance comes in. And so once we've got data, we need to take it back to our committee and make sure that they um, 
have a, a big picture of what's successful, what's not successful. And if we have gaps that we need to address, that committee is going to help us put things in place moving forward. The monitoring and the feedback falls into that surveillance piece that I just mentioned. Um, next slide. So the role of the Infection Control Committee, I've kind of touched on that a little bit, um, but essentially the committee is responsible for establishing and maintaining infection prevention and control. We talked about the monitoring and the surveillance, reporting research and education. And I, um, I wanna just take a minute to touch on the research piece. You know, for decades, infection prevention really focused on the inpatient setting, the acute care settings, and there's lots of data and lots of research in that acute care setting. What we learned from COVID is that there isn't a lot of research and um, guidance outside of the acute care setting. And so if any of you have the opportunity to get involved in any kind of research, especially if it's within a setting outside of the acute care setting, take advantage. It's an opportunity to drive the work that we do and to share best practice and um, help put things in place. Um, so I'll, I'll leave my spiel there. Um, the committee also is a, a mechanism for the infection prevention and control program to report acti activities. And again, that goes back to the previous slide. If we're not sharing what we're doing, um, people don't know. The Infection Prevention and Control Committee is a nice um, body to share what we've done, to highlight the successes that we've made based on what we've identified in our risk assessment. And then when we're struggling or we have challenges and we need help, that multidisciplinary team of people at the table are our eyes and ears out on the unit. They're the people that we can reach out to to help drive the work. Um, so it's not just me as the IP, it's the committee as a team moving this work forward. Um, and then the other important piece is that the committee is a liaison between departments. Um, everybody's responsible for patient care and supporting departments. So your infection control committee is gonna look a little bit different depending on your setting. So an infection control committee in the long-term care setting looks very different than those in an acute care setting, but you wanna have integral people there. So pharmacy, environmental services, facilities, because they're gonna help you build your policies. They're gonna be able to speak to that work when they're out in the facility doing things and they understand why things were put in place and what was put in place and how to move it forward. Next slide. Now we'll start getting to the, um, to the crux of things. So the Infection Prevention and Control Risk Assessment, or we refer to it as an ICRA. Um, and there will be, there can, ICRAs can be, can mean two different things. Um, so the risk assessment is different than a construction risk assessment. So just keep, I put that out there just because everybody's got different things going on and, and to make sure that we're clear on the risk assessment that we're going to talk about here is specific to your plan. It's a foundational um, information source for us as infection preventionists to pull together um, for an or from an organizational perspective, what we think our risks are gonna be and what we need to focus our work on. Um, the risk assessment is conducted by identifying and reviewing potential risks for infection related to care, treatment, and services. And so that risk assessment, oftentimes the infection prevention will start it, but um, we may need information from other people. And so we pull in people um, to include people at the health department, depending on what we're looking at. Um, if we want to know what TB looks like in our state, we're going to reach out to the people that will have that statewide information. Um, next slide, please. So the risk assessment, this is an example of one from um, SPICE out of the University of North Carolina. SPICE stands for Statewide Program for Infection Control and Epidemiology. And I'm going to put just a quick plug in. If you guys are looking for 
tools. If you're new into infection prevention and you just want to see what's available, there are some states that have some great tools that are free and accessible. They're editable. This is one of them. Um, and so from an infection, from a risk assessment to get started, um, you want to keep it simple, but make it impactful. You want to um, not make it too challenging and cumbersome. So when you're looking at your risk assessment, the, the things that we're going to look at, that top row, probability of occurrence, how likely is this to occur in your facility? And then you're going to, going down that column, you're going to score it. Three is a high, two is a medium, one is a low. Um, so an example, and I just threw numbers in here to show you um, some different things. So lack of communication with transferring facilities. Um, in some facilities, that's going to be a high. So you might score it as a three. Um, here I scored it as a two. Temporary harm. It depends on what information isn't referred to the referring facility. Um, that second column, you're looking at risk level of failure. So if you have a failure from that first column, your probability of occurrence, that affects your risk. You're going to look at... Um, what that, how significant that risk is going to be. If it's life-threatening, you're going to score it high, and maybe there's no harm, so you would score it as a zero. Here, I just plugged in a one. Moving to the third column, potential change in care. So what you want to look at there is, will treatment or care be needed because of that um, occurrence that caused harm, and now you have to address what kind of care that harm requires. Here I plugged in a two. And then preparedness. You're gonna look at how prepared your facility is to address that um, gap in, in um, doing what, what the facility should have been doing, dealing with the risk level of failure and the harm to the patient. And so if you come across, you assign a risk level to it. So. I like to use the red, yellow, green. This tool says that anything eight or higher is a high priority. So when you're doing your risk assessment and you're um, looking at the numbers, those things that are red, those things that are eight or greater are gonna be the things that you're gonna focus on for the coming year in your plan. So um, in that top one, I squared a six, means it's a yellow um, and so I might keep it on my radar. I might not put it in my plan, depending on how many high priorities or how many red um, issues come up. So in the second row, again, I just threw in some numbers to show you guys um, color coding and how you can, once you get your risk assessment filled out, then look at that risk assessment and focus on those red areas or those areas that score eight or higher. Every risk assessment is gonna have their own tool. Some risk assessments, they'll use different numbers. There's another one that um, I was looking at and for them high was anything 12 to 25 and um, medium risk was anything from eight to 12 and then low risk was anything lower than eight. So when you pick a tool, make sure you understand what, um, what the metrics are that they use for scoring that tool and what those different um, risks mean. Um, your risk assessments are going to be different depending on what you use, but essentially what you want to look at is um, infection events and then practice failures. Identify what your risks are going to be, what ones are going to be high priority, and then you're going to take this. So I'm going to backtrack for just a minute. When I started to think about the processes, you know, we think about putting our plan together first and identifying our risks. You want to do your risk assessment first, and then when you put your plan together, you have all the things that you need to um, develop that plan because you want to write into your plan if your um, high risk area is TB in your facility, if you've had an exposure and you want to focus on making sure that everybody um, is fit tested and um, has had a PPD or um, whatever, you can highlight that as you put your plan together. Um, next slide, please. 
I wanted to throw this in um, just briefly to, to as an example of a simple plan. And again, as you're putting your plan together, don't be afraid to um, go on the internet and see what things are available. Some of the tools facilities will have um, freely accessible and they've given permission for you to take it and use it. Um, this is one that I like because it's simple, it's easy, and it really walks you through um, putting things together. Again, I want to touch base on number three here, structure and authority, making sure that um, you have an authority statement. And it's going to be different than just marking on here. In your plan, you note that you have an authority statement, but Usually it's a one page document that identifies who the medical director is. If you have a governing board, they need to sign off on your authority statement, but making sure that that's completed. Um, oftentimes working with different facilities, that's one of the pieces that gets left out. That authority statement comes into play if you have challenges um, with your program people aren't compliant with different pieces of it and you've gone to um, the different levels to try and drive compliance, say with hand hygiene. From an infection prevention perspective, our um, uh, hammer's not a good word, but our power comes from the committee and the authority statement given to that medical director or whoever oversees your infection prevention program and whoever is your chair for your um, infection control committee. And, and so just to kind of share that piece with you guys, this is, there are um, template tools out there for your programs. Next slide. So this is an example um, I was talking about your authority statement. It's brief and to the point. This is one page. Um, I pulled bits and pieces from different authority statements that I had seen and put this together um, to use with facilities who don't have one and who are just starting out. I like something simple like this because you can fill in the specifics. Um, again, getting your chair of infection control committee, getting your facility administrator. If you have a governing board that you have to respond to, it's a nice way for them to be aware of um, your committee and what that authority looks like. And if for some reason it should get to the point of reaching out to a governing body, um, they will have had a heads up because they've signed this document. Next slide. And that's it. These are um, just the resources that I use, the links to the different um, pieces of information, a couple of the articles that I pulled some of the definitions from um, available for you to use. And that's it. I'll turn it back over to Mountain Pacific. Okay, thank you, Terry. Um, does anyone have any questions for Terry? There were a couple of comments here in the chat, just that I love SPICE resources. Another good resource for tools and documents and templates is um, Washington State's um, health department. Um, health departments are a great um, place to go look at if you're looking for stuff on sepsis, if you're looking for long-term care focused work, there's lots of stuff out there. Yes, I agree, Terry, with Washington State. We have shared forward some of their resources as well. So I would agree with that. So um, it looks like Minnesota Department of Health is another one. Yes, Minnesota is amazing. Um, clearly, you guys can tell that <laughs> I spread the wealth as to where I go for information. And um, especially as you're getting started, just trying to see what's out there. Because once you, once you start putting stuff together and, and um, writing programs and doing your risk assessments, it becomes easier and you find that you're not reaching out for as many resources, but um, they're there. And as long as they make them available um, and they give um, authorization to use them, it, it doesn't make sense necessarily to always recreate the wheel. Yes, agreed. 
Terry, there is a question in the chat here. Um, when you have more than a few metrics over eight, how do you decide which ones to focus on? Oh, I wondered if somebody would ask that. Um, <laughs> so let me see if I understand. So if I had, say, eight different high priority focus areas, um, I might look and see if I can, if there are some that I can um, piggyback on each other. So, um, so maybe if you have a couple of respiratory illness ones, some of the interventions would be the same. Is that kind yeah, of what you're thinking? Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, one of the big areas that we see gaps in is cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. Um, and so if you're looking at stuff and you have issues, um, maybe an OB with them cleaning um, isolates and um, in the burn unit, there are issues with them cleaning the bathtubs. I might focus my um, in my plan for a risk overall cleaning and disinfection. Um, and maybe attack it that way versus individual risks. Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it does get challenging. And I think that that kind of falls in line with, in my mind, those yellow areas, sometimes I think can be something that I don't wanna lose sight of. Um, because if we can nip some of those yellow areas in the bud, they don't rise up to the level of being a red the next time you focus on them. So it can get tricky. And that's where you're sometimes um, having discussions within your infection control committee can help decide and drive how you're going to address the risks um, moving forward for the year if that makes sense. Because when, when you're doing your risk assessment, it's not something that I do solely alone as an infection preventionist. Um, you're gonna have dietary at the table. You're, you may, I'm not gonna, let me backtrack. You may, depending on your setting, have dietary at the table. You'll have lab at the table. You'll have nursing at the table. Um, an example might be, um, another example of addressing a risk, say, the, the lab has um, blood culture contamination rates that are well above what the standard acceptable rate is. Um, and I just lost my train of thought. So the lab has an issue because they need to address blood culture contamination rates. Um, and through looking at the information, you identify that the majority of your contaminated blood cultures are coming out of the ED. Um, ED has an issue because maybe they have a lot of staff turnover and they're working with travelers and we're not sure the kind of education that the travelers have had. So lab and ED might work together to provide, to develop training, the lab's going to know what kind of training needs to be in place, and then they can work with the ED to provide training to their staff and do it to all staff, not just your new staff, not just your travelers. Um, and that way you address both. You're addressing best practice for blood draws, you're addressing um, reducing um, blood culture contamination. You're, it has a component for antibiotic stewardship because if you can improve practice and you can reduce contaminated blood cultures, ideally you're going to reduce um, exposure to antibiotics because physicians aren't going to be treating patients for contaminated blood cultures that they weren't sure about. Um, and so that's where your infection control committee can help drive what you want to focus on and how you want to how do you want to approach it. Thanks, Terry. Um, looks like we've got a couple more questions in the chat, so we're going to run over just by a couple minutes here, but um, these might be more addressed towards the Mountain Pacific team, but you're definitely welcome to um, chip in if you know anything, Terry. So this next one says, what is the best practice for suction canisters? How frequently do you change them out, and do you rinse, clean, and reuse, or cap and discard? Can anybody uh, address that one? 
You want me to chime in real quick? Sure. Or yep, one of Mountain Pacific can do as well. Okay. How about Mountain Pacific? Chat, it's a sucky topic. <laughs> Lori <laughs> does like her puns. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Do you want to go ahead and answer her, Lori? So, yeah, and I tossed it into chat as well. But uh, just from the HAI risk perspective, I would encourage changing out those yonkers and tubing on a regular basis. Best practice would probably say every day um, because the longer secretions sit, the longer we have the risk of, you know, creating germs that and bacteria and things that will grow and thus, you know, potentially contaminate. So, and then a canister is, is fine to be there. The suction goes one way. I wouldn't reuse it though. I would suggest they're designed to be capped and thrown away. Um, so I would suggest not reusing them um, just because, especially if you end up using it between patients or it just mitigates any risks you might have. Going back to that strategy of your, uh, <laughs> from your risk assessment, Terry, beautifully done by the way that, you know, that just decreases that risk of spreading infection. I think you hit the nail on the head, Lori. Um, and I, I would agree with you about capping it and just discarding it. What is discouraged is, because um, you'd have to open and pour to discard it. And then you worry about risk of exposure, splashing. You, you um, yeah, it just, there's a lot of risk if you open and discard versus just getting rid of it and putting a new canister up. Okay, it looks like we've got one final question that we'll address before we uh, end the meeting. And it says, has anyone received any insight or has any insight on updates to the CMS QSOs for the SNF or LTC addressing TBP to a positive COVID-19 resident, i.e. droplet contacts still is the standard? Yeah, this is Lori again. I guess I, I can take a stab at that. So, one, we know that COVID 19 spreads through the air. So, ideally, someone being plain, placed in airborne precautions um, is appropriate. When you don't have um, an airborne infection isolation room available, as many of our long term cares do not, um, then our CDC recommendation, which is what CMS says to refer to now, use the CDC recommendation. The CDC recommendation would be for them to keep that door closed and treat it as airborne, but putting them like on droplet precautions, um, because that's the highest that you can achieve there with without um, a negative airflow room. Um, but that would also mean that you still would be in full PPE. In other words, it would still require an N95 respirator. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, Mary, you can go to the next slide. So we just want to remind everybody that if you could please fill out the um, oh god called the evaluation Bernie no sorry about my dog um, the evaluation really appreciate it and then next week we will be going over um, HIPAA I'm sorry not HIPAA we're going over HIPAA security risk analysis and then also um, the Center for Excellence for Behavior Health and Nursing Facilities will have a presentation from Stephanie Smith from Comagine. So there will be two presentations next week. So we do hope that you can join us. And we wanna thank everybody for taking their time um, to join us this afternoon. And thank you, Terry, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see all of you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.